Good morning. Well, most of our Christmas programming is over for another year. And the last kids uh, play and, and sharing was this morning. We had a packed out house for that. And I thank you for coming for this service. Next Sunday's regular Christmas Sundays, both services. So I hope you'll come and invite Santa, if you can never find Santa, Mrs. Santa, Rudolph, anybody, bring somebody with you. Let's have a, let's have a great closing out. Then the next evening is the 24th, I believe, and it's Christmas Eve, 6 o'clock, we'll do communion. There will be carols, and I doubt if we'll have candlelight, but we'll have some light. And I'm looking forward to uh, a great Christmas Eve communion service. Join us for that, 6 o'clock. Turn with me to the book of Amos. Amos was a farmer, calloused hands, rough farm clothes, sunburned face, hard worker, God found him out there among the uh, groves and among the cattle and called him to ministry. Without any seminary training, God used him in a tremendous way. Then the seventh chapter, beginning in verse 14, then answered Amos and said to Amaziah, that was the uh, preacher at the king's court, Mr. Polish, Mr. Orator, Mr. Know Everything, he said, I was no prophet. Neither was I a prophet's son, but I was a herdsman and a gatherer of sycamore fruit. And the Lord took me as I followed the flock. And the Lord said unto me, Go prophesy unto my people, go preach. And in Amos 8 and verse 1, Thus hath the Lord God showed unto me, and behold, a basket of summer fruit. I want to pick it up here with Amos. Amos was a rancher. He raised cattle. He was a farm boy. All through his book, he alludes to his life as a peasant. For example, he talks about sheep torn by a lion. He talks about the cattle of Bashan. He mentions a cart full of sheaves. He uh, talks about sifted corn, and he mentions a plowman, and he, uh, he shares about vine dressers, very unpolished kind of a preacher. And that's why he had said, I was no prophet. My daddy wasn't a preacher. I never went to any schools of religious learning. God came and called me and said, preach or burn. And he didn't want to burn, and so he entered the ministry as a preacher. He never rose to the hikes of Daniel with all of his imagery. He he lacked Ezekiel's imagination. He didn't have the tears of a weeping prophet Jeremiah. He didn't have the polish and the shine of Isaiah. He didn't have cherubims like Ezekiel and seraphims like Isaiah. He was just an old barn storming preacher, but he preached the truth. Amaziah thought he was crude and thought he was rude and didn't want him into the city preaching around the temple courts. He stabbed his foes in short, abrupt sentences. He used a verbal ox gourd like Shamgar instead of the... uh, verbal sword of Goliath. It was no shined shaft. His was just a sharp stick. In his prophecy, he sends flames at Syria, lightning upon Tyrus, and he hurls darts at Eden. He pours vials of wrath upon Ammon, and he thunders out, prepare to meet thy God. Everybody somewhere in life needs a preacher that will tell you you'd better get ready to meet God because you're going to meet God someday in answer. However, Amos was called to something very interesting in the Bible. Nobody else that it was ever said of. Amos is called a gatherer of sycamore fruit. Now at first glance, 
When somebody says a gatherer of sycamore fruit, you see somebody that has an orchard and they're gathering baskets of fruit. But that's not what it means. It meant that he was a bruiser of sycamore fruit. He was a pricker of sycamore fruit. He would a scratcher of sycamore fruit. Let me tell you what it means. The fruit of the sycamore tree was a very interesting fruit. It tasted much like a fig, only it wasn't nearly as sweet, and it was very difficult to ever get it to ripen. I had an orchard some years ago back in Indiana, not a big one, about 40 some fruit trees, and I had every kind of tree nearly that I could get. I had some types of pears that would not ripen unless you took them off the tree and wrapped them in brown sacks and put them in a cool place, and after a month or so, they'd start ripening and sweetening up. I had an apple, and it's got a technical name, but I called it the black Arkansas apple. And you'd had to pick it and then put it in the refrigerator in a bag, and it would turn totally black, and it was one of the best tart apples I've ever sank my teeth into. But it took something to get it right. And in order to get the sycamore fruit ripe, it had to be bruised. It didn't ripen easily. And it couldn't ripen by itself. And it would not ripen until it was bruised. So they had to employ someone to take an iron comb and bruise or scratch or prick the sycamore fruit. They thought after the Iron comb had been used for the bruising of the fruit, it would become sweet. You see, the sycamore fruit was very bitter until it was bruised. After it was bruised, it would ripen, but it would not ripen until it was bruised first. Then after it's ripened, it becomes one of the sweetest of all fruits. So the sycamore fruit would become sweet after it was wounded. Until then, it was too bitter to eat. Once it was Wounded, once it was bruised, it would become sweet. Did you know a lot of Christians are that way? Sometimes I believe that God looks down from out of the sky and he sees that some of us are not very sweet. Some of us have bitterness in our life. And God has to allow a bruising to take place in our life. We've got to be bruised in order to be used. David made the statement of the 119th Psalm, verse 67. Before I was afflicted, I went astray. But now have I kept thy word. Back before God had spanked him or God had whipped him or God had dealt with him, he said, I was always going astray, but once God bruised me and wounded me, it drew me back close to the shepherd's side. Job said, though he slay me, yet will I serve him. And he had experienced the bruisings of life. He knew what it meant to be broken. He had lost everything that was dear to him in life. But the bruising only made him closer to God. It was the apostle Paul that wrote about a thorn. Remember, he talked about a thorn in his side. In 2 Corinthians 12, verse 8, he said three times, I pleaded with the Lord to take it away from me, but he said to me, my grace is sufficient for you, for my power is made perfect in weakness. Therefore, I will boast all the more gladly about my weaknesses so that Christ's power may rest on me. That is why, for Christ's sake, I delight in weaknesses, in insults, in hardships, in persecutions, in difficulties, for when I am weak, then am I strong. David made a statement that's very interesting to me. He said, the sacrifices of God are a broken spirit, a broken and a contrite heart, O God, thou wilt not despise. God looks away from arrogance and self-centeredness. But when he sees a bruised and a broken spirit that's willing to serve him, God's impressed by it. And when David was bruised, he humbled himself until God said in Acts 13, 22, he raised up for them David as king, to whom also he gave testimony and said, I have found David, the son of Jesse, a man after my own heart, who will do all my will. But not so with his predecessor, 
King Saul started out so humbly, but over the years became self-centered and arrogant until the old preacher Samuel said, when thou was little in thine own sight, wast thou not made the head over the tribes of Israel? And the Lord anointed thee king over Israel. But because thou hast rejected the word of the Lord, God said, I have also rejected thee from being king. God only uses broken and bruised things. I was reading again the miracle of the feeding of the 5,000. Remember that account? Did you know there were also children and women that were there? But the Bible only mentions the feeding of the 5,000 men. Everybody else seemed to be discounted. The women seemed not to be worthy to be counted. The children that may have been there were discounted. And yet, the Lord used a little lad's lunch. A little lad that didn't seem to count for much, that wasn't even mentioned as a part of the counting of the 5,000 men. And yet God used the discounted and those that don't seem to count to meet the needs of others. I thought of 1 Corinthians 1, 26, Paul said, For you see your calling, brethren, how that not many wise men after the flesh, not many haughty, not many noble are called, but God had chosen the foolish things of the world to confound the wise. And God had chosen the weak things of the world to confound the things which are mighty. And in that account, before Jesus blessed that lad's lunch, he broke it first. And you'll never be a blessing until, first of all, you've been broken first. Then your life is multiplied. Then what you have to offer to God will be used to its fullest. Except a corn of wheat fall in the ground and die, it abideth alone. But if it die, it bringeth forth much fruit. Somebody said, he's a cocky fella. Well, don't criticize him. Just leave him alone. God's not through with him yet. Eventually, God will get around if he wants to. He'll bruise him in order so that he could use him. And when God bruises or he pricks us, those burdens and the heartaches come. And then and only then can a Christian ripen and mature. Somebody, somebody says, Pastor, why do so many sorrows come into my life? Well, God may be allowing a bruising of you so that your fruit will taste sweet. I've looked back over my life. Can I just say this to you this morning? I do not regret one heartache that I've gone through. I don't regret one tear that I've shed. I don't regret one battle that I've fought or one scar that I wear or any times I've had a broken heart because God allowed those things to make my life to be a little sweeter. Maybe God saw a bitterness getting into my attitude, so God allows a bruising to come into our lives. And could I just stop and say this? Let the Lord do the bruising. Don't help him. That's his job. Don't help the Lord get all of his work done. But as the bruisings of life come, you and I are better able to stand, and our fruit will be a lot sweeter. As you look back over your life, aren't you glad that God allowed some bruising occasionally to come? into your life. The most powerful evangelist I believe that I've ever witnessed in my life. I heard him when I was a boy. He was in the Second World War and he saw more killing. He led commands up the hills and, and, uh, and during the battles men would be shot all around him and traitors would turn back and cowards would run and they they. They, they mowed the enemy down with all the bloodshed, the screaming, and the death when he returned from that Second World War and went out in the oil fields to work. God called him to preach, but he hardened his heart and became so hardened. Nobody could hardly stand to be around him. He had one thing in life that he loved. He had a little three-year-old daughter, and I've heard him tell it. He had a little daughter that would beat him with her Beautiful blonde curly hair. He would come in smeared with old crude oil and stench and all of that all over him. But as he would near the front door of the house, that little sweet thing would throw up her hands and say, Oh, daddy, hold me. Daddy, hold me. 
But he came in one evening and that little girl didn't meet him at the door. And when he got the front door open, his wife said, get, get the car quick. Something's wrong with our girl. She died. He had to bury all of the joy and the dreams that he had out there in the ground in baby land. But he was so broken, he looked up and he said, God, I'm broken enough now to be used. I'll not run from you anymore if you want me in ministry. The year was 1820. Beautiful little girl was born. A couple of weeks after her birth, she developed some kind of an infection in her eyes. An incompetent doctor applied the wrong remedy and left her blinded for life. Her name was Fanny Crosby. And I think you've heard of the name. Bruised by life, she developed a gift of hymn writing and has written more than 9,000 hymns. In fact, the matter, she wrote so many that she went under 200 different pen names for fear that the only songs in the hymnal would be written by Fanny Crosby and many of those songs written by her go under another name and not the name Fanny Crosby. And I thought... Boy, she went through difficult times. Wonder what she thought blinded. Somebody asked her, oh, she said, I've never regretted being blinded. She said, when I, my eyes will see for the first time in heaven, I've written a song about it. I want to see my Savior, first of all. Bruised by life, but used by God. The story of Fanny Crosby, bruised. I thought of men voted out of their denomination that could have gotten bitter like Finney, Wesley, Jonathan Edwards, Spurgeon, D.L. Moody. They were bruised, but they were used. And then I'd like to secondly talk about being used or refused. Amos picks it up in chapter 8, the first two verses, and he talks about a basket of summer fruit. Do you know anything about summer fruit? Summer fruit's different than other fruit. Summer fruit has to be used right now or it'll spoil. You can't wait around and use it later. It's got to be canned right now. You've got to use it. If you don't, by the time you get up the next morning, it's bruised all over and beginning to, to rot and beginning to spoil. Some of you here today are in the prime of life. You talk about summer fruit, you've got life together. I don't know if you're using your life for God. You've got finances, you've got health, you've got some years out ahead of you. What is it that you have that God could use? Is it finances? Maybe God wants you to give. You need to do that while it'll do the most good, not after you're gone and who knows how will it be squandered? Could it be time? Could it be hospitality? Could it be talent? So God asked Amos, what seest thou? And he said, I, I see a basket of summer fruit. Then said the Lord unto me, the end is come. I will not again pass by them anymore. What's he saying? He said, they missed their opportunity to be a blessing. It'll never come their way again. I was cleaning out a rental a few years back, five or six years ago, and somebody had left a stack of books, and among them was a book about the story of Winnie Ruth Judd. Winnie grew up in a free Methodist parsonage. Her daddy was a preacher. At an early age, Winnie Ruth Judd had a call to the mission field, headed to Bible college, studying for all of that, and somehow off campus got involved with a married man, and her life took a strange, odd twist. Her heart began to get cold toward God and warm toward this gentleman. <laughs> extracurricular activity. One morning during a revival at the college, she'd gone down the aisle under deep conviction. And the people that gathered around her to pray realized that she was wrestling over this call to the mission field. And finally she looked up and screamed out at God and shook her fist and said, God, I'll not go to India. You can't make me go. 
Got up and walked out of that college chapel, got her things and left the dorm and got her a job nearby, didn't go back home and continued her affair with this man, only to find that he was a player. And he had two other girls on the hook. If you read the story, you know it better than I probably. In a jealous rage, took a little 25 caliber pistol and went down and shot both of the other young girls and killed them. Put their bodies in trunks and had them put on a train and shipped all the way out to California with a fake address. And there they sat at the Union Station on the platform. It wasn't long, body fluids begin to run out and a terrible odor, and nobody's claiming the trunks, and the authorities are contacted and they come. And when they break open the trunks, they find this unsightly mess. And they start an investigation that goes all the way back to Arizona, and finally they track down Winnie Ruth Judd, and she was tried and convicted in a court of law and put in prison, and her mind began to go and put in mental institution six times. She escaped either from a penal institution or a mental institution. She'd be gone once she was gone for many years. Once under assumed name lived and married a man and lived together a pretty full life and then was caught and captured and convicted again. Somewhere up in Oregon at that time. One of those escapades she'd escaped and was on the run and somewhere along the tracks of Yuma, Arizona, a motorist driving the highway saw a strange sight. Off across the desert sand, it looked like a human crawling on their hands and knees. He told his wife, it looks like I see somebody out there. And he stopped the car and made his way out across the heated desert. And sure enough, it was a woman. And she was so dehydrated, she was near death, and her tongue was swollen so thick she could only slur speech. He spoke to her, and she didn't seem to hear, and he dropped down near her face, and he spoke to her again, and he heard her say, God, God, I'll go to India. And I've heard Simeon O. Smith, a college president, tell that story after she had left college. I'll not go to India. They're on her knees in the desert sand, said God. Which way? I don't know which way. Wherever India is, I'll go. What are you saying, preacher? I'm saying to you this morning, it's summer fruit. And summer fruit is telling whatever God's called you to do, you better start doing it. Don't let your life be rotting away. Don't let your talents be squandered. But you'd better use it now rather than to have it refuse later, missed opportunity. In 1 Samuel 16, 6 is one of the strangest scenes to me. God refused Jesse's oldest son. What was there about him that God refused and rejected, that God saw all it came to pass? When they were come, that Samuel looked on Eliab and said, surely the Lord's anointed is before him. But the Lord said unto Samuel, look not on his countenance or on the height of his stature, because I have refused him. For the Lord seeth not as a man seeth, for man looketh on the outward appearance, but the Lord looketh on the heart. Summer fruit is telling us to be used and not refused, used now. lose it forever my last thought is this be used or excused it's Luke chapter 14 the story begins in verse 15 it's a parable about a great supper invitations have been sent out all across the countryside people receive these invitations to come to this elaborate great supper at no charge the king's paying for it but the amazing thing in verse 18, it said they all with one consent begin to make excuse. Excuses were made about work and about a wedding and about wealth and, you know, I've got to do some landscaping and plant flowers and cut grass and all that kind of stuff. And then the master was very angry and he excused them all. 
by saying none of those men which are bidden shall taste of my supper. Don't on that final moment of time hear those words depart from me in the outer darkness and excuse forever. What kind of fruit are you? Are you good fruit? Or would you say, preacher, I'm, I guess I'm kind of bitter fruit. There's things in my life that's turned me off and turned me away. Or would you just say, I'm just kind of the fruit that hangs out on the tree limb somewhere. I just sit in a display. I'm just there to be seen. It's used or be excused. I think an outstanding little verse is nestled away in the Writings of Isaiah chapter 53, verse 5, where it speaks about our Lord that he was bruised for our iniquities. It tells me that somebody else was bruised so that we don't have to be bruised. He took our chastisement. He took our penalty. Thank God for Jesus Christ the sheep that was led to the slaughterhouse to be bruised for us. Father, take this little simple message in this second service on this Sunday in December. Some of us may have to go through some dark times so that our life will be useful. Maybe some bruising, I don't know. We know only that we felt this to be laid on our heart for this service. We don't want refused. We don't want excused. We need to be used. Whatever it takes that our life might be useful for your kingdom, we pray, oh God, allow it to come. If it comes to get our attention, if it comes to break us of our stubborn will, if it comes to get us from just hanging around on the trees or being on display, that we can become useful in the kingdom of Almighty God. Don't let us just occupy time and space. But you've got something special for each life in the building. And we know it because you laid it on our heart. You had something you wanted to say to this particular audience this morning. And so right where we're seated, right in these moments, I'd, I'd pray, oh God, scratch around on our thinking. Let the divine iron comb prick our minds. Saul had fought against you and he found it hard to kick against the pricks. And sometimes conviction and the movement of God and the finger of God moving around in our heart reminds us that we've only got one life and it'll soon be passed. And what we do for Christ is the only thing that's going to last. And I pray for out of the service for the benefit of all of us who've come. May some of us catch what, Lord, you have to say to us. Let us see again what Amos the old preacher saw when he saw that summer fruit and realized opportunity might be missed forever to be a blessing to others. And so it'll help us to take advantage of this opportunity this morning and to respond in our minds and in our hearts and open the front door and say, Lord, whatever it is you have to say to me, Lord, I'm saying yes to your will. I will be what you've called me to be. And I don't want to be bitter. I want to be sweet. And if necessary, bring the things into my life that will sweeten me and take away that Something about me that would cause me to be refused is a lie. But Lord, let us be used. I pray in Christ's name. Stand together with me if you would. Our heads bowed for a moment. And our eyes closed just for a bit. I wonder how many would show by an upraised hand, preacher. I want God to use my life. Can you just put a hand up? How many like that? I've got my hand up. I, I'm not ashamed to put both up. I want God to use my life. Sometimes just honoring God by saying, Lord, I'll obey you rather than wait till affliction comes to keep us from going astray. 
And I'd like to challenge you this morning. If you don't mind, I'd like to challenge you. Let God use your life. It's getting away from you. Don't squander whatever God has given to you. Use it for his glory. Don't miss opportunity to be a real blessing. Someday soon, you'll hear the sound of the lid closing on somebody. It means their opportunities are gone. And I'm challenging you this morning. Obey God before that lid closes on you. While the light is still shining, health is still in your body, money's in your pocket, and you've got a tongue that can say yes to God, surrender to him, and be obedient to him. Father, bring dismissal to us. Bring a spirit of obedience to us as well. We thank you for this time of the year, and Lord, for all that you're doing for the service this morning and all the children for this service, this second service that we were allowed to be a part of. As we go our way into this brand new week, let us go to be used of you is my prayer. In the name of Jesus, we pray dismiss us. Amen. And amen. Shake hands, visit, stay around as long as you want. I'm leaving eventually for dinner, but I'll talk for a while. God bless you as you go. Sing us out.